In the early 19th century, Napoleon Bonaparte had set out to conquer Europe. And while he ultimately fell hard, twice, his military campaigns and rulership dramatically reshaped the political and societal norms of the continent, especially in his adopted homeland of France. Many of the pivotal events in his life occurred around the capital city of Paris. So in this video, we'll take a look at various historic landmarks and artifacts associated with Napoleon that are spread throughout Paris and the immediate vicinity of the Ile de France. Napoleon was a native Corsican. However, he was educated from the age of nine in France as a Frenchman. In 1784, Napoleon was admitted to the École Militaire. In fact, he was the first Corsican to graduate from France's premier military institute, and he completed a two-year course in one. The École Militaire, located not too far from the Invalides, had been built in 1750 and is still a French military academy. By 1789, France was embroiled in a bloody revolution. Napoleon ended up serving in the French Revolutionary Army, and personally he reportedly had Jacobin sympathies. He did witness the infamous massacre of the Swiss Guards protecting the royal family at the Tuileries Palace. It was an important royal palace built in front of the Louvre that stood right about here. Sadly, the Palais des Tuileries was burned in the 1871 Commune. I do wish it was still there, but here are some fragments from the palace. In 1795, Napoleon was placed in charge of defending the National Convention convening at the Tuileries Palace against a mob of royalists. He did this successfully by utilizing artillery. Around this time, he met Josephine de Beauharnais, a 32-year-old mother and widow. She had been the wife of a French politician that got guillotined during the revolution. Her first husband was buried in a mass grave of over a thousand beheaded victims of the Reign of Terror at the Picpus Cemetery, which happens to be right next to the grave of the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette did meet Napoleon on numerous occasions, though he disliked Napoleon's coup and dictatorship. Anyways, back to Josephine. Napoleon, then a 26-year-old officer, proposed to her and they were married in March of 1796. While Napoleon was away on military campaigns in Italy and Egypt, Josephine purchased a giant manor house 12 kilometers to the west of Paris, the Chateau de Malmaison. Apparently Napoleon was not happy about it, since she bought it on borrowed money with hopes he'd be bringing back a lot more from Egypt. I accidentally deleted my footage of Malmaison so pictures will have to suffice. But Josephine restored the rundown palace, and being a major patron of the arts, filled her house with beautiful art and furnishings. The interior of Malmaison is awesome. While they both had affairs on the side, Josephine was not able to produce a male heir, so Napoleon eventually divorced her. As part of that agreement, she did acquire full ownership of Malmaison, and lived here until her death from pneumonia in 1814, while Napoleon was in exile on Elba. Josephine is entombed in the Parois Saint-Pierre Saint-Paul de Rouille. When Napoleon returned from his first exile, he set up shop in Malmaison since she was gone. By 1804, Napoleon was able to maneuver himself into a position of absolute power, crowning himself as the Emperor of France. The formal coronation took place inside Notre Dame Cathedral, Unfortunately, I do not have footage of the interior, as the cathedral is currently under renovation after a devastating fire in 2019. The scene was famously depicted by Jacques-Louis David in his huge painting now on display at the Louvre, in which Napoleon is crowning Josephine as Empress. Napoleon utilized his newfound power and influence to revamp the city of Paris and improve the capital's image across the nation and eventual empire. Many of these changes occurred during the years of the Consulat between 1800 and 1804. Paris became a truly modern city in the first decade of the 19th century. For example, in 1800, the city was separated into 12 arrondissements, with each arrondissement or district being governed by its own prefects or mayors, which were chosen by Napoleon back then. This system of city government still largely exists, though there are 20 arrondissements now. Napoleon created new big cemeteries outside the city walls, the first being Père Lachaise Cemetery, which by the way is fascinating to visit. 
One highlight of Napoleon's changes was the construction of the Rue de Rivoli, a major road on the right bank which passes by the Louvre and Jardin de Tuileries. On the other side of the road, a series of buildings with roughly identical facades and arcaded walkways were constructed. That modern uniform design was a big inspiration for Baron Haussmann and his redevelopment of the city decades later, generating the relatively uniform Haussmannian look Paris has today. The first section of this northern wing of the Louvre was also constructed during that time period. Napoleon brought back many relics from his Egyptian campaign, during which the idea was first raised to bring one of the ancient obelisks from Luxor to Paris. France finally acquired this obelisk in the middle of the Place de la Concorde in the 1820s. By the way, the Place de la Concorde was where many of the French Revolution executions by guillotine took place. Napoleon did have this monument built at the Place de Châtelet in 1808 to commemorate his military victories, even though Egypt wasn't exactly successful. It features a Roman-style column and symbology, as well as sphinxes surrounding the base. Napoleon became a big fan of Roman and Egyptian art and architecture. This is actually the largest surviving monument from Napoleon's reign in the city. Napoleon also had a giant elephant built on the Place de la Bastille, the site of the Bastille prison. Only a 24-foot tall plaster scale model of the elephant he had in mind was ever built, and it was displayed here under a shelter from 1813 until 1846. By then, the elephant became a haven for Paris's rat population as they pestered local residents, so it was sadly destroyed and the full elephant was never built. It was replaced by the July Column. No, this is not a monument to the storming of the Bastille during the Revolution, but instead commemorates the Revolution of 1830. I do kind of wish there was a colossal elephant here instead. There is an impressive triumphal column in the center of the Place Vendôme. Napoleon did liken himself to a Roman emperor, so in 1805 he had what is basically a copy of Trajan's column in Rome constructed in this square to commemorate the Battle of Austerlitz. The column was composed of melted down Austrian and Russian artillery pieces. It features a spiraling frieze along the length of the column depicting the battle and is topped by a statue of the emperor. After Napoleon's exile in 1814, his statue atop the original column was replaced by a sculpture of a fleur-de-lis. But during the Second Empire of Napoleon III, a new Napoleon sculpture was hoisted up there. However, that column got destroyed during the Commune. The realist artist Gustave Courbet led and largely paid for an effort to get the column restored, and here it stands again today. Architecture during the Napoleonic era clearly took much inspiration from ancient Rome. Though Napoleon never actually visited Rome himself, Napoleon commissioned a Roman-style triumphal archway to be built at the Louvre, the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. It is based on the Arch of Septimius Severus in Rome. The Arc de Triomphe du Carousel was completed in 1808 and features bas reliefs of Napoleon's triumphs by that point. Clearly, the archway was under scaffolding for restoration during my visit. A supersized triumphal archway was also commissioned at that time in line with the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. It became known as the Arc de Triomphe de l'Etoile and is now perhaps Paris's most iconic monument. It was completed decades later in 1836 and serves as the centerpiece of Paris's historical axis, an imaginary line that can be made by passing through the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel at the Louvre, down the Champs Elysees through the Arc de Triomphe, and in the late 20th century, it was extended to the Grand Arch at La Défense, just outside the city limits. The Arc de Triomphe is inscribed with the names of generals during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. There are also nationalistic sculptures and bas-reliefs on the arch as well. Here is the Triumph of Napoleon. In this sculpture, the general is being crowned by a laurel wreath, and history is inscribing the names of his various victories. It is juxtaposed with this sculpture, which commemorates the peace of 1815 after Napoleon's final defeat and exile from Europe. The Arc de Triomphe is a remarkable monument to visit. The sheer scale of this arch is really impressive, the sculpture and friezes are fascinating, and visitors can climb to the top for some great views, including a clear view of the historical axis. 
To further emulate classical architecture, Napoleon had a portico added onto the Palais Bourbon, which is now the meeting place of the lower chamber of the French National Assembly. The Palais Bourbon mirrors La Madeleine across the Seine. This is a church upon which construction began in the 1760s, intended as the focal point of the Place de la Concorde, but Napoleon had it reworked in the neoclassical style. He also did not intend for this to become a church, but instead function as another grand memorial to the Grande Armée. However, it did end up becoming a rather unique but beautiful church. It is well worth stopping in and taking a look around. Other big changes in Paris included the function of this structure, the Pantheon. It was originally built as the Church of Saint Genevieve, but was secularized during the Revolution. Unlike most, this was never converted back into a church, as Napoleon officially consecrated it as a national monument and mausoleum for important Frenchmen, as it still is today. The original Pont des Arts was built during Napoleon's reign. When it was completed in 1804, it was the first iron bridge in Paris. This bridge had to be rebuilt in the 1980s after a barge crashed into it. This new one is roughly identical, but has seven spans instead of nine. This did become the infamous Lovelock Bridge. They technically don't allow that anymore. The Pont Diena, completed in 1814, still exists though it was widened in the 1930s. It was named after Napoleon's big 1806 victory over the Prussians. Paris's water supply was tremendously improved during the Napoleonic era. For example, a canal was constructed connecting to the River Ourc northeast of the city. Several new fountains fed by this new and comparatively clean water were built around the city for public use, plus they were free to use. This is one of those original fountains built during Napoleon's rule, the Fontaine aux Lions de Nubi. It was originally located at the Place de la République, but can now be enjoyed at the Parc de la Villette. Napoleon was planning to build a massive palace right here, where the Eiffel Tower stands today. He planned to construct the Palais du Roi de Rome on the Champ de Mars as an administrative center for his empire. That never got built and we got the Eiffel Tower instead. After the fall of Napoleon and the Bourbon Restoration, the new King Louis XVIII melted down a statue of Napoleon and recasted that bronze into a replacement statue of King Henri IV on the Pont Neuf. That used to be Napoleon. In fact, during the Restoration period, they went around attempting to remove all of Napoleon's statues and symbology across the city. They did miss a few. Also, any ends you may see on buildings or bridges around Paris signify Napoleon III, not Napoleon I. Napoleon patronized the city's finest restaurants, including some that still exist. He reportedly frequented Le Procope in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, which claims to be the oldest cafe in Paris having originally opened in 1686. He also dined at Le Grand Vefort, a really fancy and expensive restaurant that opened just before the French Revolution in the Palais Royal. During the Revolution, sections of the Louvre Palace were turned into a museum displaying the artistic treasures confiscated from the Catholic Church and the royal family. Napoleon expanded his collection significantly and named it after himself. For a time, the Louvre was called the Musée Napoleon. Throughout his escapades, Napoleon continued to collect, or in other words, steal thousands of historic pieces of art from around Europe and in Egypt, so a lot of those artifacts were brought to be displayed here at the Louvre. Many of these stolen pieces of art were returned under the 1815 Treaty of Paris, but some were never repatriated. Many of those pieces are still in France as part of the Louvre, such as the Wedding Feast at Cana. This massive masterpiece of Veronese was plundered from a Venice monastery, where it was cut up by Napoleon's troops and brought to the Louvre. Many of the pieces were returned, like the Battle of Alexander at Isis, which was taken from Munich in 1800. Of course, Napoleon was a big fan of Alexander the Great. This painting was recovered by Prussians, who reportedly found it hanging in Napoleon's bathroom at the Chateau de saint Cloud. It is now back on display in Munich. Sir Thomas Lawrence, the famed English portraitist who was one of many English people to visit the collection of the Musée Napoleon during its short span of existence, 
did write that he was saddened about the collection's dissolution after 1815, despite the unjust circumstances in which they had acquired much of the art. Of course, Britain was one of the only places in Western Europe that did not get its artwork taken by the Grand Armée. If you think the Louvre is impressive now, imagine what it was like when Napoleon could take whatever he wanted across most of the continent. Napoleon's troops did discover the Rosetta Stone during the Egyptian campaign, though they did have to give it over to the British by the end of the conflict. Nowadays it's one of the most contentious artifacts in London, but if it did not end up at the British Museum, it would have ended up at the Louvre. The Louvre today is home to many significant paintings by Jacques-Louis David, who was often commissioned by Napoleon and his brother Joseph Bonaparte to create many monumental portraits of the Emperor and his military conquests. The coronation of Napoleon is truly incredible. Aside from the Louvre, there are other museums in Paris where you can see some Napoleon-related artifacts. The Musée Carnavale, the Museum of the History of the City of Paris located in Le Marais, has some cool Napoleon-related artifacts. My favorite being his campaign travel kit, which contained a portable toilet for him to use while out conquering. The Musée Carnavale is a fantastic museum, the best city history museum I've ever been to. This is one of Napoleon's thrones, which was created for him to sit in on sessions of the consulate at the Tuileries. It is now on display at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs within the Louvre Palace complex. There is a bed used by Napoleon in 1807 on display at the Musée Marmottan, which is also home to the world's largest collection of Claude Monet artwork. It is definitely a hidden gem. In 1802, Napoleon established the Légion d'Honneur, which is still the highest order of merit in France. It is both a military and civil award. There is a museum about the Légion d'Honneur in Paris, located inside an old mansion that Thomas Jefferson really liked, right next to the Musée d'Orsay. The museum features a lot of historic Légion d'Honneur medals, medals of similar prestige from nations around the world, and some personal effects of Napoleon like his table clock. It is a surprisingly large and interesting museum which is definitely worth a visit. Most visitors walk right on by it. As mentioned, Napoleon divorced Josephine as she could not bear him an heir. He decided to arrange for some established royal blood in Europe. So he took Marie Louise, the daughter of the final Holy Roman Emperor, who was then the Habsburg Kaiser Franz II. Marie-Louise grew up in Austria at war with France and suffering many defeats by Napoleon. She was raised to despise him and the French, but ended up getting married off to him and becoming Empress of France in 1810. Napoleon actually sent a representative to stand in for him at his wedding in Vienna, which happened in that church. Marie-Louise did soon give birth to a son, Napoleon II, the King of Rome, of course, Napoleon's fortunes would change tremendously in the following years after his Bosch invasion of Russia. After that, Austria joined back in the fight against Napoleon. Marie-Louise left France in 1814 and returned to Austria. She did become the Duchess of Parma and is entombed in the Imperial Crypt of the Habsburgs in Vienna. Just across from one of Napoleon's military rivals, Archduke Karl, who did score a rare win over Napoleon at Asper Nestling. The legendary Chateau de Versailles was largely abandoned after the royal family was removed and the court left. The place still had a bad rep among most French people by the time Napoleon came to power, so he chose not to move into the palace. However, he did develop plans for a restoration of the nearby Trianons, some smaller and more humble abodes, at least compared to the extravagance of the main palace. The Grand Trianon was converted into an official residence of Napoleon, Napoleon would occasionally stay here with Marie-Louise. The appearance of this palace today with its empire-style furnishings is largely how it appeared during his time here. After Napoleon was gone, King Louis-Philippe would also live here at the Grand Trianon, and he is the one who restored Versailles into a museum glorifying the history of France. The French citizen king did sponsor the creation of the Gallery of Great Battles in the largest room of the palace which features 33 monumental paintings of French military victories, which included many led by Napoleon, such as the Battle of Austerlitz. This scene was actually commissioned during Napoleon's reign. 
The adjoining Salle de Sacre, or Coronation Room, was actually designed to glorify the legacy of Napoleon, featuring a full-scale copy of David's coronation scene. The original painting was on display in this room until the late 19th century. The distribution of the eagles is an authentic David painting. It was commissioned by Napoleon. In this scene set on the Champ de Mars, the Emperor hands over new flags to his Roman-style imperial legions as they swear an oath of loyalty to him. David was a true master of propaganda. Napoleon did take a liking to the magnificent Chateau de Fontainebleau, which is about 55 kilometers southeast of the city. In 1804, the newly declared emperor visited the dilapidated former royal palace and decided to have it refurbished to his former glory so that Pope Pius VII could stay here during his coronation. The throne room of Fontainebleau, inside the former bedroom of the kings, is precisely preserved to how it appeared when Napoleon took his throne in here. In fact, it is the only authentically preserved throne room at any castle in France, which is amazing! It is so awesome to be inside this room. This was Napoleon's bedroom, which he did not change too much from the time of Louis XIV. Napoleon was decisively defeated at the Battle of the Nations in October of 1813 by a coalition of many European powers, bringing his conquest to an end in Europe's largest and most bloody battle ever before the Great War. So Napoleon returned to Fontainebleau. By the next spring, the Sixth Coalition had successfully invaded France and took Paris. The occupying coalition states and the French government forced Napoleon to abdicate and exile himself. The battered and despairing emperor was here at Fontainebleau when he got the news. The Treaty of Fontainebleau was signed right here in this room, and it was here that Napoleon formally abdicated his throne. The Chateau de Fontainebleau also has a Musée Napoleon Premier, a sizable display of many artifacts related to the emperor and Bonaparte family. For example, that's one of Napoleon's swords. Napoleon used that field kit during the War of the Fifth Coalition against Austria. And there is one of the Emperor's frock coats and classic bicorn hats. The Chateau de Fontainebleau often gets overlooked but clearly has tremendous significance and is a phenomenal day trip from Paris. Napoleon quickly got bored of ruling the island of Elba in exile, so he came back to France a year later and rapidly rebuilt his army on his way to Paris, but that didn't last too long as the other European powers came back together to put an end to Napoleon Bonaparte once and for all at Waterloo. Trophies from the Battle of Waterloo are scattered at military museums and installations across Europe, like the Waterloo Battery which is guarded at the Tower of London. Napoleon was then exiled much much farther away to St. Helena, one of the most remote islands in the world located in the South Atlantic where he lived out the rest of his days and died in 1821. He was originally buried on the island. But in 1840, King Louis-Philippe arranged for the Retour des Cendres, the Return of the Ashes, as Napoleon's remains were brought back from the island to be entombed in France. Initially, there were calls for him to be entombed in the base of the Colonne Vendôme, as the Emperor Trajan had his ashes placed inside his column. However, it was decided to reconfigure the dome church of the Hôtel des Invalides, which was originally built to the glory of the Sun King, to instead serve as the Grand Tomb of the Emperor. On the 15th of December 1840, a grand funeral procession was held as the cortege passed under the Arc de Triomphe, which Napoleon never got to see completed, down the Champs-Élysées, through the Place de la Concorde, and ending with a funeral at Les Invalides. Originally, Napoleon was entombed in the southwestern chapel of the church for about two decades. Then in 1861 he was transferred again. This time his remains were placed directly under the rotunda of the dome church in a colossal sarcophagus. His body is encased under four separate coffins like nesting dolls. First a tin coffin, then a mahogany, third a lead, and finally another mahogany coffin. The sarcophagus is composed of a purple shoksha quartzite. The tomb is surrounded by ten bas reliefs glorifying the emperor and emphasizing his role in changes to French society, such as the Napoleonic Code. 
These reliefs are really interesting. Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, who was the new emperor of France when the body was transferred to this sarcophagus, was also considering moving Napoleon to the Basilica of Saint Denis, where historically the sovereigns of France were interred, but he decided to leave him here at the Envalide. In 1940, during the Nazi occupation, Adolf Hitler did visit the tomb of Napoleon and arranged for the remains of Napoleon's son, Napoleon II, to be moved from Vienna and reinterred at the Dome Church. This tomb was finally completed in 1969. Napoleon's brothers were entombed in the side chapels near Napoleon in the 1860s as well. This is the tomb of Joseph Bonaparte, whom Napoleon had installed as the King of Naples and later Spain. And this is the tomb of Jerome, the former King of Westphalia. Napoleon's original sarcophagus from 1840 to 1861 was located in this chapel where Jerome is today. Napoleon's tomb in this magnificent church is awesome. There is nothing else like it. Napoleon's original tombstone from St. Helena can be seen at the Envalide. Visitors can only look at it from a corridor next to the Dome Church. Most people have no idea it's there, but that was Napoleon's original grave marker. The Chateau de Malmaison displays some incredible artifacts from Napoleon's exile at St. Helene including furnishings from the Longwood house where he lived and died. For example, those are Napoleon's socks and boots from St. Helena. Napoleon would often sit on this garden bench during his exile, where he possibly said there is nothing we can do, according to the meme at least. Napoleon had this camp bed prepared to go, in case he ever got to escape the island and go to the United States, where he presumed he would be installed as emperor. But that never happened, and his dead body was placed on it before the autopsy. And there's his death mask. Other souvenirs from St. Helena got around. George Vanderbilt got a hold of the Emperor's chest set, which is sometimes displayed at Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina. Those chess pieces were the last army Napoleon ever commanded. Also, fun fact, Napoleon's junk is not with the rest of his body at the Envalide. Yep, it is most likely true that during the autopsy the doctor cut it off and kept it. It is now hidden in a box in New Jersey. The Hotel des Invalides, built as a hospital and living center for disabled veterans, not only holds the remains of Napoleon today, but is also home to the Musée de l'Armée, a fantastic museum of French military history. Unsurprisingly, the Napoleonic era gets a lot of space. Some highlights include a case of four pistols that were owned by Napoleon. My personal favorite is this, Napoleon's freaking horse. This is the taxidermy body of Le Vizier, the emperor's faithful horse used during the War of the Fourth Coalition. Napoleon rode this horse during battles like Iena. Le Vizier went with Napoleon into exile on Elba, and actually outlived him. And that's his imperial saddle. They also display thousands of antique miniature toy figurines featuring Napoleonic war scenes. They're fun to see. This is the deathbed of Napoleon Bonaparte. One of the most influential men in history passed away while lying in this camp bed on St. Helena on the 5th of May, 1821. One of his iconic hats sits upon the deathbed. Napoleon Bonaparte has a tremendous and incredibly complex legacy, which in many ways is quite controversial today. Heck, he's been super controversial for over 200 years now, especially considering his wars killed somewhere between three and six and a half million people in Europe. Regardless, there are some incredible locations to visit and learn about the life and times of Napoleon around Paris. Please consider taking a look at my other history and travel videos. I will have an extensive and rather in-depth series on the attractions and historic sites of Paris coming soon, including videos on every single location shown in this video, so stay tuned by subscribing to the channel. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could like the video and share it. Thanks for watching!